out. So first thing, uh, was everyone able to find the recording that I put up on third, I guess it was Thursday, um, the Chomsky one? And how did that go? Were people okay with that? Did that work all right? Were there any questions? If you got any questions, you can ask or write them in the chat or anything. I also, if you have any questions about the material. So first question is, did it work? Like, was everyone able to find the video? Did it load right? Did it make sense, et cetera? And then number two, is are there any questions about the Chomsky reading itself or that anything that wasn't clear from it? Um, if so, feel free to ask or you can email me or anything. I just want to make sure that we're all on board. It was basically for those of you who didn't get a chance to watch yet, it was explaining one guy's argument for why behaviorism, which is what we talked about last time uh, in person, was not a successful theory of psychology. And the basic idea was that there are certain human behaviors that cannot be explained entirely in terms of environmental conditions. And specifically, Chomsky talked about language. And then your assignment, uh, which was due on Sunday night on the like weekly uh, discussion board thing, was to come up with one other behavior. And the reason I didn't uh, send back responses to that is two things. One, I wanted to say here in class, if you haven't done it yet, because it's the first one where it's actually material, uh, if you want to go back and turn that in now, you can do it and I won't take off any credit. So if you're like, oh crap, I forgot to do the weekly assignment that was due on Sunday, totally forgot. You can do it now. I won't take off any points. I will include the grades and put it into the book. Also, uh, one other thing, if you don't, if you know you turned it in and you didn't hear it back from me, that means you got to check on it. You got hundred percent. You're good to go. Uh, it's basically, I don't want to send out 40 emails every week that just say, you got to check, you got to check, you got to check. So unless you hear otherwise, you got to check. Um, if you want to reach out just to make sure, feel free. But if you get a check plus or a check minus, I'll reach out to you. Um, but basically, don't worry about it. Uh, if you get a check minus, you basically have to like insult my entire family. Um, I don't really, you're, you're going to be fine as long as you turn it in. And check pluses are very hard. You really have to like blow me away. Uh, and so as long as you're just doing what you're supposed to do, not again most of the questions are going to be like this week where it was like uh, I want to know your opinion on this and there's not really a wrong answer so um hopefully that's clear uh we all on board we're all good all right great um all right so what we're going to do this class is we're going to continue on the theme from last week uh is that a hand or is that just a mistyped thumb okay we're good all right, so what we're going to do this week is kind of continue the general idea of what last week was. So going back to class one, we talked about how in psychology, you generally begin with this idea that people do things because they believe stuff and they have desires and they want to do stuff and they think they can do stuff. So why does somebody bring an umbrella? Well, they think it's going to rain and they think they don't want to get their feet wet. So that's where we began. And then we started looking at a view last week, which tr tries to say that maybe that's not the way to do psychology. Maybe the way to do psychology is to try to get rid of all that mind stuff and instead explain everything in terms of behaviors and say, if we want to have a scientific theory of human beings, we need to define everything in terms of what environmental conditions the creature is in and what their past history is like. And then the little lecture on Thursday was saying, all right, this doesn't work for every behavior. So the way it's kind of gone is we have common sense, and then we said, well, maybe let's throw out common sense and start anew. Let's go with something like behaviorism. And then Chomsky and others came along and said, no, 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 that's not going to work. So we're back to where we began with ordinary common sense views on why people do things or what we're going to be calling it today, uh, folk psychology. So now what we're going to do is look at a second view that suggests maybe folk psychology is wrong. Maybe even if behaviorism isn't right, we can still try to define why humans do things the way they do in a different way. And so today we're going to talk about the other, one of the other major views that says, no, 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 let's not talk. If we want to understand psychology, we need to totally revamp and totally re-understand what we're doing here. And so this view is called, well, any takers? It was in the title of the reading for this week. Just shout it out or type in the chat or whatever you want. Existential materialism. Yeah, so it's uh, it's not quite existential, but you're basically right. It's another long E word. Eliminative 
and I have no idea if I spelled that right. It's also kind of a made up word. So if you got it right, eliminative materialism. And basically, eliminative is just some stupid philosopher's way of saying, like, it, it's basically an adjective form of eliminate. So it's basically, we eliminate something and instead in its place we have materialism. So what do we mean by eliminative materialism and what is this view? So basically what eliminative, I should put it back up, eliminative materialism. What eliminative materialism is, is it's this view that when we're going to finally have a science of human beings and human minds, we never have to talk about beliefs or desires or feelings. All we do is explain things in terms of the brain. So instead of saying, why did this person go to the store? Well, they wanted food and they thought they could get at the store. You instead say something like, well, at that time, this is a brain in case you can't tell, there was an electrical, a positive electrical current in this corner of the right hemisphere that radiated outward at approximately, uh, it got to this point at about 300 milliseconds and started at about 100 milliseconds after they were presented with a certain picture and blah, blah, blah. And so that is what a material, a little, a little, a little, an eliminative materialist says all psychology is going to turn into. We're never going to have to talk about beliefs. We're never going to have to talk about desires. And in fact, anyone who says we should continue talking about beliefs and desires is just fundamentally wrong. Beliefs and desires and feelings and all that sort of stuff goes the way that witches go. The people who used to say, why did the crops fail? Oh, it was the witches. Now, a little limitative materialist, or I'm just going to say materialist, because if I keep saying a limitative materialist, I'm going to get tongue-tied for the whole class. Uh, so they basically say, beliefs are like witches. Anyone who says the reason you went to the store is because you had a belief that you could get food there is somebody who's basically saying, well, I went to the store because there were witches there, or the witches made me do it. It's not real. It needs to be thrown out. And if we want a science, all we can do is talk in terms of brains. And so another way of putting this, and this was a word that came up a few times in the reading that I wanted to highlight, is uh, this word, ontology. How many people have seen this word before and know what it means? Any takers? What does it mean? Anyone know? It's the study of being. Yeah, it's, it's the study of being, or it's basically just the study of what exists. So an ontology is just looking at what you think is real and what isn't real. So for instance, um, if you have one person uh, who believes that ghosts are real, and you have a different person who's like, no, ghosts aren't real, these people have a disagreement about ontology. One of them thinks that the way the world is, is there are these things, ghosts in it, the other one says it isn't. So all ontology is, is a big fancy word for saying what you think exists or the study of what you think exists. So the way you can think about this debate between materialists and normal folk psychology supporters or the everyday person is they have a disagreement about ontology. Somebody who accepts folk psychology or in our everyday life, these people say one of the things that exists are beliefs, desires, wants, intentions, um, hopes, dreams, and a, a materialist is going to say, no, 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 in our ontology, all we should be saying exists are brains, electricity, etc. So this is just the general idea of what materialism or eliminative materialism is. And the reason it's called eliminative materialism is they're saying we are eliminating all of our usual common sense ideas of beliefs, desires, wants, uh, dreams, hopes, intentions. And in its place, we just go with materialism, a physical world defined in terms of brains and electrical currents, et cetera. So you can think of it just as a, in the same way that behaviorism said, if we want to do science, we need to get rid of all of these things instead of talk in terms of behaviors and environmental conditions, the materialist begins in the same way. It says, yes, we have to throw out beliefs, desires, everything else. And instead, we talk about brains and brain waves and everything else. So does that make sense to everyone? This is just the background of what this other view is. Um, all right. So 
Now, what we've discussed thus far isn't saying that materialism is right. And so what the Churchland reading that I assigned for today was, was this is one of, he, it's actually like a fun sociological fact. There are two people who are most known these days for being eliminative materialists, and they are named Paul and Patricia Churchland, and they are married. Uh, so the, the two major people who hold this view are a couple, which is just like kind of a funny sociological fact. I'm, I'd love to know what like dinner conversations are like between them. Um, I'm sure that would be entertaining. But yeah, so the Churchland's view is that they don't, they're going to try to, they don't just say materialism is a view, therefore it's right. They try to show that materialism is what everyone should be. And anyone who accepts the old fashioned folk psychology view is wrong. And so the way this argue, the, the paper I gave you is kind of structured is first, and I think the paper was written by Paul, so Mr. Churchland in this case, or doc, I mean, they're both Dr. Churchland, but male Churchland. Uh, he starts off by saying, well, if you're gonna be a materialist, you're getting rid of folk psychology. So first thing we should do is talk a little bit more about what folk psychology is, what this view is that we begin with, most people begin with in psychology, including professionals, including professors, like this is not like just, it's called folk psychology or common sense psychology, but it's much more than that in an academic setting. And then he says, I'm going to give you this other view, eliminative materialism. And while I can't prove to you that eliminative materialism is better right now, there's good reason to think that down the line in the future, we can get rid of folk psychology entirely in the same way we said we got rid of witches explaining, like saying that things didn't work out because the witches. In the same way, down the line, we might not be there yet, but we can do it all in terms of brains. And the way he argues for this is he says, one, if you actually take a closer look at folk psychology, it's a lot less successful and explains a lot less stuff than we typically think. And secondly, if you look at the way that folk psychology has typically gone and the way people argue for it, it looks a lot like some other really bad sciences that were in the past. So he says, if you look at the way people talk about folk psychology today, it looks a lot like al alchemy, alchemy, yeah, alchemy, or something like phlogiston in chemistry. And I'll explain a little more later on in class what on earth he's talking about here. But it's basically, he doesn't show directly that materialism is better right now. What he says is there's good reason to think it's going to get better. And this other view looks a lot like all this crap we've had in the past. So we have good reason to think, even though we don't have a better version now, we're going to, and the one we have right now is crap. So we should start moving that direction anyway. Um, so that's just the general gist of how the argument goes. So the first step in this um, is just to say a little more, this is also a great opportunity just to say a little more about what people mean by folk or common sense psychology. Now, this is something we talked about in the first class where I was basically talking about uh, beliefs, desires, uh, what you believe to be true, help it combining with what you want to have happen and controlling your behavior and controlling what goes on in your head. But what exactly does that mean? How does it fit? What is the status of this in our lives, et cetera? And so Churchland is by going against this view gives us a good, useful way of first understanding it better. And this is just, just a side note. Um, in any sort of discussion you have in your everyday life or in any sort of paper you have to write, it's always useful uh, to first get very clear about what you're disagreeing with and showing that you fully understand it and then responding to it. So that's really what he does here is he starts off by saying, here's this view, folk psychology. Let's before anything else get really clear what we're talking about and then I'm gonna argue against it. So he says, here's this view, folk psychology. Um, and as I said, it's things in terms of beliefs, desires, et cetera. And there, does anyone know the big fancy term for what these things like believing or hoping or intending are called? He uses the, I want to go over this because he used it a few times in the article and I realize some of you might not be familiar with this term. Uh, it's a phrase. Anyone from the reading know what it is? I can start filling in more letters. Is that propositional? Yes, propositional attitudes. And so 
I want to spend just a minute explaining what propositional attitudes are and why philosophers talk about them. And most importantly, what on earth this means. Because when we're using proposition in this sense, we're not using it in the sense of like attempting to have some sort of like sexual liaison with someone. It's a philosophical notion, not a, you know, way to get in trouble with HR notion. Um, so what we mean by propositional here is a proposition is basically whatever it is, it's a thing that can be true or false that a person can think about. So basically the way of thinking of this, and it's one of these notions that's really, really difficult to define, but it plays a really useful role in philosophy and anytime you're thinking about like contents of things. So here's an idea. I want the, or I believe that, uh, I don't know, what's something really unlikely? The Jets are gonna win the Super Bowl this year. So you say, I believe that the Jets are going to win the Super Bowl. So in this sense, there's two parts of the sentence. I believe and that the Jets will win the Super Bowl. And so this part right here in red is what we're calling a proposition. And the proposition is just the content that you believe. And generally you think of it as it's something that could be true or false. It could be true by some miracle of God that the Jets end up winning the Super Bowl this year. It could also end up being false, which is far more likely because the Jets aren't very good. But this thing here that could be true or false is the content of this belief you have. The reason propositions are useful is because it's useful to think of them as a content that be, can be shared by various different things. A person could believe that the Jets could win, but also a different person could, same content it seems like, uh, George desires that the Jets, or I can get rid of that. The same thing that I believe that the Jets can, are going to win is something which George can desire to have happen. And it's also something that, say, the Jets' ownership can intend to have happen by getting more players and et cetera. So it seems like there's this one thing, this proposition that we all can interact with and that can be true or false. And it's just useful to speak about it in terms of these things that are out there that are true or false that we all can interact with. Um, and the reason why it seems like you and I can have a disagreement about whether the Jets will win the Super Bowl is there's this thing, this propositional content that you and I can have a disagreement about. I believe it. You don't believe it. George desires it. Um, the Jets ownership intends it. So this is what we're talking about with a proposition, just basically the thing that comes after a that in a sentence like I believe or I desire. And what a propositional attitude is, is just the sort of uh, mental um, relationship you can stand into to one of these contents. So believing is a propositional attitude. It's an attitude or a relationship you can stand in to a proposition. Desiring is one, intending is one, hoping is one. Um, all of these are types of mental relationships you can stand into some content. And so what a folk psychology does is it takes seriously that things are, these things are real. General common sense psychology, if you ask like, why did they cheat on you? Or why did, your, why did your parents get a divorce? It's gonna be things like, my mom believed that my dad was no longer the man for her. Or my partner believed that I wouldn't find out that they cheated on me. So, and the idea is that this is supposed to be a real true thing and there's this content that this person believes or desires. And so folk psychology or common sense psychology thinks that these things are very real and they actually explain our behaviors. Um, so this makes sense to everyone so far. What I just mean by proposition, what a propositional attitude is, this is a lot of background stuff, uh, but it, it's something that'll be coming up again and again and again throughout the semester, so it's useful. There's one other thing I wanna highlight. Um, so that's what propositional are, things are in general, what a proposition is, it's the content. But a question you might have at this point is, what, is, what does it mean to believe something? Or what does it mean to desire something? How do you even understand that thing? And in normal everyday psychology, these things are defined functionally. So, um, functional definition. Or another way of, I can't spell. Another way of putting this is that uh, 
ordinary psychology is functionalist. So what do I mean by functionalist? Has anyone heard this term before to say a, ver a notion is functionalist? Uh, uh, we don't care about the, this material scene. We only care about what function it has. Exactly. So the idea is there are many things in the world. Some of them are defined in terms of uh, like their component parts or defined in terms of uh, their relations to other things. But there's other things that are defined in terms of what they do. So to just contrast it, what makes a human being a human being? What is it to be human? This is a tough question, but there are a few different answers a person might give. What is it to be human? Owned by a human. Say that again, right? Because owned by a mother, that is a human. Yeah, they were birthed by another human mother is one thing. And another thing tied in with this is like, in the same way, if you're birthed by a human mother, you have a certain type of DNA. Or another one is like, what makes something water? What does your chemistry teacher tell you? Well, it's made up of H, two hydrogen molecule, or two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. That's how you define water. Another thing you could say is like, what is it to be a father? Well, to be a father is just to be relate, my, to be my father is to be related to me in a certain way. Now, what is it to be a mouse trap? What, how do you define a mouse trap? Something constructed for the intentional purpose of capturing a mouse. Yeah. All a mouse trap is, is something that's job is to catch or more often in New York City, kill a mouse. Does it matter how, what it's made out of? No. No, you can have, let's name them. We're all new, most of us have lived in New York City at some point. We've got glue traps, what else do we have? The old wooden ones with the yeah, clip. The little wooden ones that, you know, the mouse walks in and then this thing snaps down and then the mouse dies because his neck's broken. That's another type of mouse trap. Another type of mouse trap is, you know, they look like this. Some people think they're cute. I don't quite understand them, okay. but um, cats. yeah, cats. That's another type of mouse trap you could have. All of these are mouse traps. It doesn't matter what it's made out of. You know, if you put like a piece of peanut butter under a stick and had a really heavy book on top, and that book, as soon as the mouse came by, knocked over the stick and smushed it. Another type of mouse trap. All it takes to be a mouse trap is to be something whose job it is is to catch mice. Doesn't matter what it's made out of, doesn't matter how it's designed, doesn't matter who did it. And so what a common sense psychology holds is that in the same way that a mouse trap is just defined by whether it captures or kills mice, to believe something or to de desire something is just to stand in a certain functional relationship to a certain content. So you stand or put yourself mentally in a certain relationship to something which can be true or false. So, for instance, what is it to believe something? If I tell you that I believe the sun's gonna rise tomorrow, so the proposition here that I'm believing is that the sun will rise. What's, and I tell you I believe this, what does that mean? What is the functional relationship to believe this proposition? And there's not really a totally right answer here, I'm just trying to, you know, Get some more people talking. If in the past you observe the sun's raising every day, then you are in this state that you believe it's going to be raised tomorrow. Yeah, so it seems like what's, what it's going to do is I think it's going to happen again. Or there's a sense in which it's something that I take going to be true. And I'm going to treat it as something is true. So for instance, if I know that the sun, or if I believe the sun's gonna rise tomorrow and I'm a very pale person, that if I'm going for a run tomorrow, I'm gonna put on sunscreen because I have this belief. I take it that it's gonna be true. If I desire it to happen, it's not something that I believe, but it's something that I have a, if I could bring it about, I might go and try to make it happen. Or if it happens, it will make me happy to stand in a relationship to this, that's what it is to desire something or to intend to do something. So if I intend that uh, I have intend that I have a sandwich for lunch, 
what that means is it's part of my plan or I'm going to go out of my way to ensure that I get a sandwich as the thing I eat for lunch. So again, we've got the content that I have a sandwich for lunch and intending is a function I can like a functional relationship I can stand in there um, to that thing. So does this make sense to everyone? This is just a common sense idea of psychology. The idea is that in our everyday lives, it's true or false, and there are really these things, intentions and beliefs and desires, and all of these things are real, and all they involve is being in a certain functional relationship to a particular uh, state of affairs or a particular thing that could be true or false, and a thing which both of us could think about. So you could intend that I have a sandwich for lunch as well. You could uh, decide that I haven't eaten sandwiches in a while, so you go and buy me a sandwich and give it to me. Or you or I could both have separate beliefs that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Um, and all it is is just to stand in a certain type of relationship to a certain content. Does this make sense? Are we all on board? This should be kind of, this is our common sense, ordinary idea about how we get around in the world. So if you say like, why did that person bring an umbrella? You say, well, they took it as a truth. They believed that it was going to rain and they desired not that they would not get wet. So this is all folk psychology is. And what most psychologists do is they take for granted that something like this picture is correct. So if you've been to therapy before, um, like a, in a professional, like mental, uh, like basically a doctor for your mind, they will ask you things like, why did you believe that? Or what do you think made you do that? And the answers they're looking for are in terms of things like beliefs and desires. Or if you want to try to explain why your cat did something or like a, a behavioral uh, psychologist working on animals, they will say things like the cat thought there was a piece of food there. And so most of the time, most psychologists, and if you've taken psychology classes, you generally take it for granted that these sorts of propositional attitudes are real things that can be true or false. There's a fact of the matter. Either I believe the Jets are going to win the Super Bowl or I don't believe the Jets are going to win the Super Bowl. And all general psychology does is takes this for granted and then tries to understand, all right, but what is it to intend? Or how does this work? Where do these contents come from? And so that's really just kind of fleshing out what we talked about a couple of classes ago in terms of what is ordinary psychology or what do psychologists generally think they're doing? So are we all on board with this? It's all making sense? All right, I'll give everyone a second to digest while I take a sip of water and throw my markers everywhere. We doing okay? Okay, okay? So that's the background of what uh, folk psychology is. Now what I want to do is go through Churchland's arguments to think like if this is so grounded in our everyday thoughts and our everyday common sense ideas of how the world works, why is it that we should get rid of it? What is it about common sense folk psychology defined functionally that means we should throw it out and just talk about brains? And so the two main reasons he has is one, it's, or I'm going to just put folk psychology is not as good as we think. And two, uh, it looks a lot like other failed sciences. So basically, very often we just take it for granted that beliefs and desires and feelings are things that exist and have to exist. And the world couldn't be any other way. But if you actually look more closely, you don't really 100% know that these things are real. Because it's not like, like I can be pretty sure there's a marker here. I see the marker. But with something like a belief, it seems it's much more like something like gravity. So how many of you have seen gravity? Yeah. What do you see? You don't see gravity itself. Instead, what do you see? The laws of gravity. You basically, you see a bunch of things happen and then somebody comes along and says, well, why the hell did that fall? Why is it that every time I drop a marker, it falls? Well, 
The reason is somebody comes along and says, well, there's this thing, gravity, and it controls and draws things of mass together. And so you can think of this as a sort of like thing scientists or we in our everyday life come along and say, oh, yes, we're going to posit or we're going to hypothesize that there's this thing, gravity. And even though we don't see it, if we assume it's there, we are able to explain a lot more things. So really, if all of a sudden, every time we drop something, it didn't fall or just kind of hovered there or started floating, then we'd have good reason to be like, oh, maybe we were wrong. Maybe gravity is not a thing. So it seems like folk psychology's ideas like beliefs and desires are a lot like gravity, where it's something that the reason we keep it around is because it allows us to explain things. We can say things like, why'd the dog go behind the couch? Well, the dog went behind the couch because it believed there was its toy there. Or why did the dog get uh, so excited? Well, it knew it was dinner time. So in the same way, you can say that things like beliefs, desires, etc. we don't see them, but it seems like they do a very good job explaining why people do things. But then what Churchland comes along and says is, wait a second, is folk psychology really as good of an under way of understanding the world as we typically think it is? Because if we pause and think about it, there's actually a lot that it cannot explain. So I'm going to screen share with everyone, and we're just going to look through on uh, one of the pages in which he lists off all the things that folk psychology doesn't seem able to explain. So let me see if I can figure out how to screen share, since this is always such an adventure. Uh, where are you? Oh. No. Is it, is it sharing? Is this being seen? Yes. No okay. So uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Would help if I was better at this, but um, so it's on page eight of the reading. So he basically says, if folk psychology is good, like the reason we keep gravity around is because keeping gravity around allows us to explain a whole lot of stuff. If we wanted to say, we don't see gravity, therefore we shouldn't believe it's real. Well, he comes along and says, wait a second, gravity is really useful, let's keep it. So in the same way, why do we keep beliefs, desires, et cetera, around? Well, it's because they allow us to explain a whole lot of useful things. Sorry, I'm trying to find the passage here that I'm looking for. And for some reason, it's decided to stop telling me what page I'm on. So I'm going to have to count manually. Page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. So... We only see the first page. Is it not sharing right? Yeah, it's just frozen on the uh, cover page. Screw that. We're not. We're not sharing. Um, let's bring you all back. Where is the zooms? Meeting controls. Screen sharing has stopped. Okay. Okay. Can you see me again? Okay. Just making sure. All right, so the things that he says, I'm rather than reading through it since screen share seems uncooperative, um, it's on page eight of the document if anyone wants to say it themselves, or if you can think of some things he talked about, or I can add some once I've taken another sip of water. So does anyone know what are some of the things that Churchland or things you can think of that folk psychology doesn't tell you about? So one thing he talks about is, um, all right, if I were to go like this with my marker, what can I do with this hand? You catch it. Yeah, I can catch it. I'm quite good at it, actually. It's not that difficult. But here's something. Explain to me how that happened. Well, it's got something to do with my eyes and my brain and some sort of thing, but it doesn't seem like I, folk psychology has anything to say about this. All, like it's clearly somehow mental. Like if I were to close my eyes, it gets a lot more difficult. Or if I were to close my eyes and then throw it up, like it, it doesn't go well. So there's something about what's going on in my eyes and something about how my hands work and they work together that tells me how to catch these things. Um, Folk psychology doesn't explain this. It seems like all folk psychology can do is explain if I already have beliefs and desires, how I go about them. And it seems like a good theory is gonna explain everything. A good psychology is gonna explain things like hand-eye coordination. How does hand-eye coordination work? We have a theory of it. It seems like if we're gonna explain how it works, 
we're going to have to go into the brain and understand when I see this, how this process is, what causes it so that my hand knows to close at the correct time. So there are things like hand-eye coordination, which everyone accepts is real. Everyone accepts you can improve at, but folk psychology doesn't seem able to explain it. Other things it can't really explain are feelings. Like what the hell is pain? It's Explain to me what pain is. Well, it's that thing that hurts. Uh, it's the thing you wanna avoid. Like folk psychology, it can tell you that you might look and it's gonna say, yeah, it's a feeling. But what do we mean by feeling here? It seems like if we're gonna understand pain, we have to say something about what role it's playing in our lives or more accurately, generally it's gonna be like, well, when you stab a knife into your foot, part of your brain goes and something about the makes you wanna avoid doing that in the future. Or you might describe the like intense unpleasantness of the pain. But folk psychology can't explain to you what pain is like, what that feeling is. All it can tell you is I'm gonna to go to the store because I have this belief. Or um, some other sorts of things are like, you know, how on earth are certain people so good at memorizing stuff? Like, what is it to learn something new? We can say something like, uh, today I learned in class that, uh, I don't know, something you learned today. But what is it to learn? What does it take to learn? What changes about the human body when you learn? You can say something very general like, I gained a belief, but is that science? So Churchland's argument is, look at all the things that folk psychology cannot explain. If we're going to actually have science around understanding human beings, we can't just say things like you have a belief or you have a desire. All you can do, you need something more. You need to get in. And it seems like the best thing to do is to look at brains and look at how the brain is working and how it operates. So the first one of his arguments is just, Folk psychology fails to explain a lot of things. And so this is supposed to be, if our main reason for accepting folk psychology is that it explains stuff, he comes along and says, wait a second, you're, you're, not, you're ignoring so many other things that it fails to explain. So if you want to say folk psychology is good because it explains stuff, you can't ignore all the stuff it doesn't explain. So that's one. And tied in with this, there are kind of two underlying related things. Another thing he says about it is that if you actually look at history, it seems like as time's gone on, folk psychology explains less and less and less. So he says, if you go back into like ancient times and you ask someone like, why is there a storm today? Someone will be like, well, the sea god is angry. Feelings, anger is something that a god can feel and that controls the oceans. But if we say today, it's like, well, now beliefs and desires, they don't explain the oceans. They just explain a few things that are going on in our head. So he's saying, if you actually look historically, folk psychology seems to be explaining less and less and less and less over time. So maybe the correct thing to conclude is that eventually it's not going to be used to explain anything because we've already seen it fail on a bunch of fronts. Um, is this making sense to everyone? Is this all like just the general idea is, we have this thing in our ordinary life that we use, and here comes along someone who says, no, that's crap, we should use something else, because if you actually look at it, it doesn't explain all that much. And another thing he points out is that very often in science, it looks like you get progress. So back in the day, people like, there were different explanations for why it is that things fall. Back in the day, like, does anyone know what the Greek feeling, like ancient Greeks thought the reason things fell were? Like, why does a marker, if I drop it, fall? They won't be. Yeah, it's something along the lines of the marker is imbued with something that makes it so that it wants to fall. Or it's, and then a little later, it wasn't wanting to fall. It's just like it had, a, it had the essence of fallingness imbued inside of it. Then someone came along, like Newton, who said, no, no, no. There's this force which controls everything in space and time, and it connects across the universe and pulls things towards the center of mass. Then somebody else came along, Einstein, and said, no, 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 the way this actually works is that the more material in an area, Eddie, you have a hand? Uh, shoot, fire away. So I'm just curious. So like, let's say for me, like uh, this would be an example of uh, folk psychology. Let's say I was in, for a, in the mood for a pizza. So mm -hmm. I will go to the fridge and I will get a pizza. 
that would be folk psychology because I yeah. have a desire to go get a pizza. Exactly. But if I were to explain that in the materialistic sense, I would say instead, my brain is triggering hunger signals for me to go and sense, uh, get, satisfy my hunger. So I must go. Is my it actually a full, so a materialist, what they're going to say is at our current state of affairs, where we are in neuroscience right now, you'd say something like it triggers a hunger state. But eventually, what we're eventually even going to be able to do is it caused an electrical signal of this type in this part of the brain, which led to a signal in the motor cortex, which caused the muscles to move in this way, which led those muscles to get up, cause the organism's body to get up and walk over to the fridge and then open the fridge and move the muscles in such a way that then this organism could take this object and place it in an oven and then engage in such a way that it inserted this object and then there were certain signals that caused the y yada yada. Eddie. So one last thing, out of curiosity, doesn't that kind of take away the idea then? Like in that, to me, it kind of seems implicit then you're kind of taking away the idea of free will. Yes. Like everything we do is just predetermined then in that yeah. sense. So one, what, there's a lot of stuff in the background of this view, and this was actually also in the background with the behaviorism last time, is uh, there's this general feeling we all have in our everyday lives that we are free to make decisions and have desires. And there's this thing, me, that has free will to choose what I do. Like, why did I get a sandwich? Well, I chose to get that sandwich. I wanted that sandwich. It was my decision. And both of the views from like this view of free will is very closely tied in with this idea that something like folk psychology is right. I have control over my beliefs and desires. But someone like both, uh, so Skinner was someone who very strongly argued that we have, there's no such thing as free will. And because of that, ideas of like praise and blame or like punishing someone makes no sense. Because all you are, the only reason you behave is because you were, you know, brought up in a certain way as a child. So if you were brought up in that way, you had no control over it. If a rat, every time it sees a light, presses a bar, you don't get mad at the rat. You get, you just say, well, here's a fact. So in the same way, human beings, if you're a mean person, all that means is that you in a past environment were in a condition, you were conditioned a way such that now you behave in a certain way. So it makes no sense to punish you. All that it would make sense is to change your behavior. In the same way, an eliminative materialist is going to say, the explanations we have are all about brain states and causes and things like that. So therefore, it makes no sense to say that you have free will or control over your life. Once we have a complete understanding of why human beings do what human beings do, we're just going to be like everything else in the world. And any idea that we have free will or desire or anything is just wrong. All we, we are machines like everything else. Like imagine a string of dominoes. What causes the last domino to fall? Well, you flick the first domino and it knocks over all the others. We're just like other dominoes. Why do I get a sandwich? Well, it's not because I have this feeling and it's my choice. It's rather just brain processes. So once we have a complete understanding of how the world works, free will goes away. And so on the one hand, and this is actually one of the arguments, um, this is a good signal of, the way in which the very same point can be used to argue either side, depending on your views. So many people say, well, I, I'm not willing to accept that free will is false. Like that is just like a non-starter for me. It's so clear that I make choices. Therefore, eliminative materialism must be wrong. But actually what the churchlings do is they flip it on their head. They flip this argument on its head and say, well, here's a fact. Every other thing in the universe, it seems like is determined in this way where like, why is it that the tree falls over? Gravity. Why is there gravity? Well, because of mass. Why is there blah, 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 blah. So what they say is, if we ever want psychology or our understanding of human beings to be a real science, it needs to line up with other areas of science. And since every other part of science, there's no room for free will, we want to get rid of it in psychology as well. If we actually want this to work, we need to get rid of free will and belief and desire. And the best way of doing that is just to say it's all brain stuff. And you know what? You might hate that you don't have free will, but you know, I also hate that I don't have a bigger house and like 17 dogs. And I hate that I have to sleep and I can't survive entirely on pizza. Like that's just, it's unfortunate that you don't have free will, but like sucks to suck. 
Um, and that's really what their argument is on eliminative materialism. They're saying like, yeah, you don't have free will and you know what? You don't have wings either. That's just the way it is. Uh, but that was an excellent question, Eddie. And that was a really nice way to kind of integrate that in. So they're, they're going to say that you don't have free will. It all falls away. It's all just brain stuff. Um, any other questions at that point? If you didn't follow that entirely, that's fine. It's kind of a side issue um, of just something like free will is something which most people find very fascinating. Uh, just because like the idea that you're not in control, but just the product of everything that's come before is generally very disconcerting to most people. Um, all right, so he, that's the first thing is folk psychology explains a lot of things less than we would typically, if it was a right theory, it seems like it would explain everything and it doesn't. Now his other approach is to say, if you actually take a look at folk psychology, it looks a lot like if we look across the history of human thinking, it looks like we've made a lot of progress and a lot of old theories got thrown out because it turned out they were really, really bad and didn't explain things in a law-like or useful way. So for instance, it used to be that people would say, why did the crops fail? It was the witch, the local witch. Now people come along and say, well, actually there was a bacteria which infected the harvest and that bacteria was caused by shipments of whatever from another part of the country where the bacteria were different. And so it seems like now, the reason it's useful to have this new theory is if you know the reason the crops failed is because there's this new bacteria, you can do things to prevent that bacteria from striking. If all you know is that the witch did it, you can't stop a witch. You don't know who a witch is because they aren't real. It's not going to give you any power. So science seems to progress and give you more explanatory power. And so what he says is if you look back, all these scientific views which fell away, they fell away because they weren't able to explain a lot of the data and people still hung on to them and claim, no, 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 you know, witches are real. They're really good. And it was only over time that people started to say, no, that's crap. Witches aren't real. We can't explain things in terms of witches. Uh, and so what he says is if you look at some of these other theories, they look a lot like what folk psychology looks like. So if we're hanging on to folk psychology, in a lot of ways, it's the same thing as someone who believes in witches. Or the two examples he gives are, so two, no, this marker sucks, two um, folk psychology looks like other bad theories. And his two examples he gives are uh, alchemy and phlogiston. So uh, alchemy you may have heard of. Um, give me one second to read over Cynthia's question and then I'm going to jump back over here. So um, Side note, Cynthia just asked an excellent question, which is in the chat, but I will read it out loud. So if somebody's an eliminative materialist and they say that everything's determined by things that come before, how would they explain cases in which you seem to go against your feelings? So for instance, if you're really hungry, but you don't eat and you starve yourself to death, or if you're somebody who like is deeply in love and really wants to be with someone, but then you decide like, no, this isn't the person, like I probably, I may really love my sibling, but that's a bad choice, they're a blah, blah, blah. Um, so what an eliminative materialist is gonna say is that all this shows is that you have multiple things going on in your head at once, and just one of them was more powerful. So it still just proves the general rule of, you have a desire to be in love with this person, but you have a separate, even stronger desire not to commit incest or you have this feeling of hunger, but you have an even stronger belief to make a statement not to eat or to prove that you're strong or to fast for the sake of your higher being. So all this shows is that like you are somebody who has, like human beings are complex organisms, we're not bacteria. So all this is, is determinism. What it shows is there can be multiple things, but at the end of the day, it's still the driving force is gonna be stuff about what came before. Um, so great question though. That's a really excellent question about determinism and free will and that sort of thing. Um, all right, so back here. So what they look at, what, what the churchlands point to are alchemy and phlogiston. So how many people have heard these words before? Are people familiar with what these used to be like very powerful scientific things? Basically, alchemy was this view that was really popular in the Middle Ages. Uh, and it was basically like the precursor to chemistry. 
And they said that the reason things are the way they are, so today we all think they're made up of atoms and molecules and these little things have little properties and when you combine them together, new things happen. Well, the medievals thought that actually all things had souls. And the way that uh, there were four different types of souls that a creature could or a thing could have, and these souls would combine together to cause it the way that it was. So like the soul of mercury was in things that were shiny and it made them shiny and made them melt. So the, the line, human beings, we have like really fancy souls, but if you go down to the physical world, you've got yellow sulfur as a type of soul. And when a yellow sulfur soul combines with a mercury soul, you get something that's shiny. And so it was all this crap science, but they did things like, if you do it and you combine things with the right humors and they mix together, then you can create new things. And the ultimate goal was to make gold and yada yada. Basically though, starting around the 1700s, 1600s, someone came along and went, this is total crap. We need a new version of chemistry. But at the time, it looked like alchemy was a, it explained stuff. Alchemy explained why certain metals are shiny. Well, they're shiny because they are imbued with the soul of mercury. And why is this thing going to fall apart in a powder? Well, it had yellow sulfur was imbued with it. And it seems like alchemy is almost like a functional definition of why things do what they do. Why is it that uh, aluminum melts at a certain temperature and is shiny? Well, because it had the soul of mercury in it. Um, so that's what alchemy was. It was this kind of weird scientific view about why things are the way they are. And then phlogiston was a thing which was posited, I want to say in the 1800s. Basically, uh, starting around the 1800s, 1700s, people were like, why on earth does stuff burn? Because, you know, we as human beings, we're fascinated by fire. We want to know how it works. So someone came along and was like, well, what if there's this stuff inside all flammable objects called phlogiston? And when the phlogiston leaves the object, it causes a fire. So that's what phlogiston was taken to be. It was this thing that lived in all, like wood had a lot of phlogiston, which is why it would burn so easily. And like gasoline had even more, which is why it burns even more. So this was the idea of why things burned. Nowadays, no one thinks phlogiston is real because it turned out that what caused fire was oxygen being released. So if you add oxygen to something hot, it will cause a fire. So nowadays, no one thinks phlogiston is real and no one thinks alchemy is real. But at the time, someone would say, well, phlogiston's what this stuff that's in all burning things that causes them to burn. And so again, it's kind of a functional definition of why things burn. Why does that thing burn? Well, it's been in phlogistoned. And why is it not burning anymore? Well, it ran out of phlogiston. And so what Churchland says is at the time, people truly believed and full on jumped on board and said, we need, if we're gonna explain how stuff works, we need to talk about phlogiston. And then someone else came along and said, no, you don't. That's not scientific. It doesn't explain things. There's all this data. Like if phlogiston's really a thing which causes stuff to burn, then why is it that after something burns, it's no heavier, it's like no lighter than it was before it burned or things like this. Um, why is it like, if phlogiston is what causes it, why is it that if you put it in a totally dark, empty room with no air, it will never catch fire? Shouldn't the phlogiston still co coming out cause it to burn? So what, what Churchland's trying to do is say, look at these other things, phlogiston and alchemy, they look a lot like folk psychology. People said stuff burned because it had the essence of burning in it. Well, that sounds a lot like people do stuff because they have the essence of wanting to, they have a desire. What's a desire? Well, it's just that, you know, thing inside of you that makes you want to do stuff. What, that person believes this. Well, what is it to believe? Well, it's just to have, be in that functional state that makes you want to take something to be true. What is it to be ready to burn? Well, it's just to be filled with phlogiston. So the idea that Churchland's trying to play up is to say that, Folk psychology looks a lot like other crappy sciences. So the fact that you're trying to hang on and say, no, we need to keep these ideas of beliefs and desires around if we want to explain why human beings do things. No, you're just like someone who's insisting that we shouldn't make chemistry better. All you're doing is insisting we need to keep doing things the way we've always done them, even though it fails to work in a lot of cases. So does everyone understand, that's basically the whole Churchland argument. Do people want me to review basically how this thing went? I might be useful, but that's basically the, the crux of it is 
he can't prove to you that neuroscience is going to get us all the right answers at the end of the day. But he says, hanging on to folk psychology isn't the way to do it either because folk psychology is just crappy science and we get rid of crappy science. So we should get rid of folk psychology as well. And we know it's crappy science because there's all this stuff it fails to explain. Um, so does that make sense to people? Just to, to retrace where we were. We started off at the start of class by saying that, uh, you know, we think we do things because we have beliefs and desires. And what that means is we stand in some relationship mentally to some like some representation or some state of affairs. So to believe that the sun's going to rise is to stand in a relation to the fact that the belief, the world or the sun will rise or the fact that it won't rise. Um, then someone comes along and says, wait a second. And the church will say, wait a second. Why do we want to keep this around? Why don't we just go to this newer, fancier science, psychology or uh, neuroscience? Neuroscience will explain it all. We can eliminate this talks of beliefs and desires. And even though neuroscience isn't there yet, we know that folk psychology doesn't explain everything. And we know that it looks a lot like these other crappy sciences. So we have good reason to turn our backs on folk psychology now. We don't want to keep looking up something which is fake like phlogiston. We want to have a new type of science. We want to really understand how things work. And to do that, we should just look at brains and stop worrying about this. And out the window are going to go things like free will. We're not going to be able to talk if we want to be scientific in terms of wanting a pizza and choosing to get a pizza. Instead, if we want to be scientific, it's just going to be my brain is in this state, yada, yada, yada. And he says, but at the end of the day, that will be better because it will combine with the other sciences. It will be able to connect in with physics and chemistry and, and biology in ways that our views about beliefs and desires cannot. So that's the whole Churchland picture. Are we okay with the picture? We all good? All right. So now what I'm going to do, uh, I'm probably going to record it this afternoon, but very, very few people working in psychology actually accept the Churchland view. There are, I'm sure there are people in neuroscience who do, but many, many psychologists say, all right, we recognize the Churchland argument, but at the end of the day, we disagree. We think that we still need beliefs and desires. And uh, one of the main arguments they give for this is saying that if you get rid of talk of beliefs and desires, it seems like you lose all general statements. Um, it seems like if you're talking in terms of brains, then all you can talk about are particular species or even worse, particular organisms. And it looks like what, like individual organisms. Um, what they, these people are going to argue is there's lots of good reasons to think that actually eliminating beliefs and desires is even worse situation than attempting to explain things in terms of a folk psychology, which may get some things wrong or forget or fail to answer certain questions. So that, if this didn't make sense here at the end, I'm just trying to highlight where I'm going to go when I stand in front of this camera in a few hours and post it to YouTube. Um, any questions at this point? Are we all okay? If there are any questions, I can answer them now. Um, if not, I think, uh, oh, Jasmine. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, on the whole churchland argument. It just makes me think about the notion of like intuition. So it's something mm -hmm. that you can't see, right? Or is it like his explanation is like a biological factor? It's a biological thing. So what he wants to say is you don't see things like beliefs and desires. You don't see into it. And, and actually he would use intuition as a really good example of something that folk psychology fails to explain. Like, you know, that feeling we've all had, if you just kind of know someone's w watching you over your shoulder, you just kind of know someone's watching. Folk psychology can't explain that feeling. Churchland says those sorts of things like intuition and belief, that's something that we can explain in terms of brains. What we could do is we might not be able to say like, why is it that you know someone's looking? Well, because there was something at the corner of your periphery, which led to it like part of the brain to activate, but that part of the brain isn't something that reaches conscious level. So you might not fully understand why it's happening, but that is an example of something that he's going to say, here's proof that we need to eliminate because things like intuition, you don't see them. They don't really explain anything. It's kind of like just at the end of the day, you say, well, it must've been my gut feeling. It's like, what the hell is a gut feeling? He's going to say, this is a good example of why you need to get rid of it. 
um, and things like intuitions and gut feelings, he's going to say they're, they're not even real things. Like we just throw them out, get rid of beliefs, get rid of desires. They're like witches. If you want to understand why organisms do things, throw it all out. You can't see it. You can't, you, it doesn't explain anything. It's like gravity, but instead of actually explaining things, it's useless. It's like phlogiston. It's like alchemy. Does that make sense, Jasmine? I realize I may have gone off the rails. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, just making sure I was responsive. Any other questions? If something pops up after class and you want to shoot me an email, free, feel free. But that's it for today. We finished with 11 minutes to go. You can all go and get yourself some lunch. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording now. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to email me. Uh, and also we can...